studio. That's my studio now, and that's me now. I have done this uh, slideshow many different times in different different ways. I actually did it in high school, and it was called a sole proprietorship, and I did that with teenagers who all wanted to have their own business someday. All right, a little bit of background, and that is one of my first uh, pictures. I used to have to hire a model to do the uh, what I did because I sent things into some high end shows, and you had to have really good slides. Well, I loved art and sewing. I did not like cooking, but I made most of my own clothing. I loved to go to the fabric store and make something that no one else had because I could save money and I was the only one that could wear it. My one fun costume, I call it a costume, was I had was given some pink and green striped material fluorescent, made myself a jumper and I went to school with one fishnet that was green and one that was pink. I thought, oh, that was really cool. <laughs> well, my background is uh, sociology and psychology and special education. Has nothing at all to do with what I'm doing now, but I believe my weaving and my fiber arts, as some of you know, that it's kind of one of those things that's very relaxing. It gives you a way out to kind of chill out at the end of the day, and I really feel it helped ground me. Before all of that, though, I did all these other kinds of crafts that many people have done, you know, embroidery, crocheting, painted ceramics, and my mother's friends were always interested in buying anything that I had, and that made me feel really good. I had a lot of fun with that. And then one day, many, many years later, in my mid-30s, uh, we were visiting a craft show, and there was someone weaving on a loom and I bought the kit. And when I say a kit, if anyone uh, uh, knows Harrisville Designs, when you buy a loom from them, you buy every nut and bolt and you have to sand the wood. And that's what I did. But of course, I had to finish all the wood. It took me a week to finish the wood, get it together. And I thought, great, now I can make my own fabric for my own clothing. The problem was I had no idea <laughs> what I was getting into. I didn't know what weaving was. Well, so I decided to take classes, but I didn't know about the classes. You might have heard this before. I got the loom and I was very frustrated one night, uh, probably 11 o'clock at night, trying to get some string on this loom and my spouse goes, oh, you know, there's this weaving school. We go by it every time we go up to see your mother in Harrisburg called the Mannings. Of course, I had never seen the sign, but the next day I signed up for the class and lucky for me, the class was normally five students. However, this time it was only one student, me and the instructor, Marianne from Germany. We had a great time, showed me a lot. After that, it would be like, what am I doing? I'm on the loom, I'm weaving, I'm weaving. I was weaving all the time. And at the, right now I have a young woman who's about, about a year and a half ago. It's like, there I was, she's weaving all the time. And it's just so much fun to, she has me on a speed dial, let's say. It, I feel like I'm reliving part of what I had in the past, but I just spent so much time trying different things out and, and so on. And I worked out of the bedroom, our guest bedroom, and then also in the living room. But then it's like, what do you do? You're all by yourself. How do I know if you're, how do you know if you're any good? Well, I joined the Pennsylvania Guild of Craftsmen. They had a local chapter, a lot of nice people, about 40 members. Then you got to meet other weavers. I met Gloria. Gloria was kind of my mentor and helped me out in um, you know, getting started. But then I also visited shops and I also went to a lot of shows because now I'm accumulating lots of stuff. My family and friends are probably tired of getting gifts that are woven. And I wondered two things. Is my weaving good enough? And what am I going to do with it? Now I'm going to use some of my skills. Well, my skills were my weaving, money management. I'm pretty well organized. I love designing things and research, and I'm also pretty well self-disciplined. But with the, uh, I want, still wanted to know if I was, you know, my weaving was okay, if anybody liked it. The Pennsylvania Guild of Craftsmen, lucky for us, they have a program where you take your craft, whatever it is, ceramic, beading, rug hooking, whatever it is, and you take it somewhere and you're juried. 
they have a standards and there's a whole list of things that you have to meet to meet the standards you at that time way back in those days you would take slides of your work you would take your work to the setting leave it there go away and then come back to find out if you were at the time they called it juried in well i was always told that usually you know you they look at your work one time the next time you know they tell you what to do to fix it but they said if you go in and the slides are gone from the table you you were juried in well my slides were gone and i was so excited i couldn't believe it i also joined so now i could do the guild shows and now i felt like i had a stamp of approval there that something i was doing was okay I uh, also am a member of the Central Pennsylvania Weavers Guild and a member of the Hand Weavers Guild of America because those are all people that can support me and they have, you know, like minded. Now, what do you do next? Got to find places to sell. So what what am I going to do? Well, <laughs> I was afraid to do craft shows, but I did retreats. I did the spiritual frontiers kind of retreat every year and it was a safe space where you had a few vendors. And they had, you know, anything kind of new age kind of things. So I took my weaving, my clothing there for the very first time. And people loved it. So that was really nice. Then another thing that was kind of odd was a flower show conference. A friend said, oh, my mother's doing this conference flower show. Why don't we go do it? Well, we were only open for like an hour and a half or two hours. But what happened was all wow. these women and men were taking these classes and we were their audience. So they came and bought our things. So that was another fun thing. Then, of course, the Pennsylvania Guild of Craftsmen shows. And then I started looking at other juried shows. Now, I'm using the word juried and we have local shows. Sometimes when you're trying to get into something to sell, some of the shows that are juried cost a lot more money to get into. However, they also have a, and they may also have a, a fee to get in. Some of the local shows that might only be an hour or two, or a couple hours a day, don't cost as much. They might be out, outdoors. You have to decide too, outdoor, indoor. I did both outdoor and indoor, had the good, bad, and the ugly. We've even left shows when it was uh, really, really rainy. And another thing is maybe I could sell some things in some shops. Also along the way, after I started doing some of these things, you get sometimes free publicity. Now, I don't know the whole age group of the, of the group here, but I'm going to say, you never know what where you might see yourself. And some of us remember newspapers. At that time, when you would do a demonstration, maybe sitting spinning, um, weaving or whatever, you normally had someone from the newspaper that would come up and talk with you and maybe take some pictures of you. This was a really nice article that was written. They actually called me on the phone and uh, interviewed me over the phone. And they, I think it was like every couple of weeks they, they focused on someone. What I find really funny is in this article, they have my address and my home phone number. You don't do that nowadays, but that was fun. And that, as you can, I don't know if you can see, that was uh, about 19 years ago. Very nice way of getting free publicity. Another way was sheep to shawl competitions. Some of us do those. I did a cup, did those for a couple of years. And then one year, back in 1999, last century, we won first place and our shawl sold, our shawl sold for $1,500. And there it is. I took, an up, took a new picture of it. That's a sample. We had, you had to weave two. So the actual shawl was sold, if you're not familiar. And this was a sample one. And the next day I was working in public education. I was a special education teacher and someone said, hey, you're on the front page of the Harrisburg paper. I don't live in Harrisburg anymore, but that's where I grew up. So I thought that was pretty cool. There I am. And there's some other more articles on other pages. But, you know, those are the kinds of things you never know, because that's a little PR for you. Initial focus. Handwoven clothing. I was teaching in person at our guild and even in my home. We were buying and selling used equipment. That was another thing that kept me going. I would I had people interested in weaving and once in a while someone would call me, I would find something. And for many years, people were calling me looking for used equipment. Now we have the marketplace and other things going on. So I'm not doing that anymore, but I'm still weaving now items for the body and home now. I'm dyeing yarn, which I didn't sell yarn in the past. I'm still teaching and I have a YouTube channel now. Also creating patterns. 
Now, at one point, you have to say, honey, it's not a hobby anymore, because I would get, oh, you're working on your hobby. Well, no. What was cool, though, could, you can control your own work hours. Now, this is a part-time business all this time. Own boss? Yeah, yeah, you have tax write-offs. You need a new tele you need a new phone, you need a new computer, you need a new roof. Yeah, part of that might be a tax write-off. You're doing what you love. And it's really great when you have lots of happy customers and people keep buying your things. Well, it takes a lot of time. Now, today it might not take as long because we do have the internet, but it still takes time to really, really establish yourself. You have those super long hours. It's risky money as well as putting yourself out there yep record keeping dang it and you might need to get help maybe you have to contract someone some of you with farms you if you don't shear your own sheep you have someone else come in and do it maybe not a contract but they have they do some of those kinds of things i had someone who did all my sewing for me i love weaving i like sewing and then you know those unhappy customers oh yeah lots of stories about those but we won't take time to talk about them now now, what I'd like you to do if you're watching, if this is live, I'd like you to think about what are your goals? What, what are they? What are you aiming for? Just think about it. Is this going to be a part time business? Do you have an amount of money you'd like to make a year? What do you want to make? Just think about that. Have a target. Basically, that's it. Just make some kind of a target and think about that's what you're aiming for. What do you want the money for? it i'm yep we do want some money from this and as i did i just wanted to buy more fiber wanted to, buy, wanted to break even have fun buy more yarn or maybe some of you want more animals or more tractors or more whatever breaking even i heard some people at a show recently i'm just breaking even and maybe that's all you want to do have fun maybe it is a tax write-off Part-time income, that was my goal, to have a nice part-time income, my fun money, or maybe a full-time. I actually know at least three people, a potter, a fiber artist, and a jeweler. They made a living full-time on their craft business. That started back in the 90s. Don't know how that works today, but do you need a sugar daddy or sugar, sugar mama? Maybe you need someone to pay all the bills and you can have fun. Hey, that might work for you too. Still need to make our connections. I used to make in-person cold calls. I actually walked into some stores and had my things in the car. And if they wanted to look at them, I brought them in and sometimes they bought them. Be members of local guilds. Now we can be a member of a guild all over the country. We all know how social media works. Um, finding, again, our tribe, who's interested in it. Maybe you're going to e email people. Maybe you find something. My studios in a book, starting a magazine because I emailed someone saying, hey, would you be interested in my uh, pictures of my studio? And a result of that, my studio and a short article is in a book. And of course, we all know networking. Now, another new thing is branding. I never even thought of branding, but branding kind of, I guess, is something some people, it's right out there. Your logo, your design, and your packaging. I do it recycled, so I don't really have anything. Stories. I'm going to talk a lot about stories. When, I, when you're at a real a live show or whatever, if you can tell stories behind your products, how they're just maybe what inspired you or whatever, that really, really helps. And I'm going to mention that again. Your personality. Your own values. Do you have an online presence? What does it look like? I know sometimes I go to some of the to sites and I'm like, oh, I don't know what, well, I, I know what they're selling, but I can't find things. There's competition out there. Competition is good. Check your competition out. Check who's selling exactly like you're selling and what their prices are. But now maybe you're wondering, will they purchase your item? I love this picture. This is uh, a customer sent this to me. They bought the placemats. And they sent it to me and I thought, this is so cool. Anyway, is it unique? What's the quality? Are you willing to ship? And we know there's all sorts of things about shipping. And do people want what you make? Sometimes people make things because you love it, but nobody really wants it. And I feel sad for that. 
and who's your patron? Who's going to buy? Why should they purchase from you or your product or your service? Why? Well, really, we're educating the consumer. I know I have to explain to people, I, I love the question, how long did it take you to make that towel? How long did it take you to make this? I never answer exactly how long. I talk about the process. I'm kind of telling a story about it. I might talk a little bit about like the, the honeybees there in the middle. It's, uh, a beekeeper asked me to make these bees, la, 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 it's hand dyed. Uh, maybe the placemats are this, and I, I talk, talk about them. And that's what people want to know. They want to know about it. I know determining your price is really hard to do. I think when you start, you start low. And once you get confident, you raise your prices. Do a time study. I really did a time study. I know exactly how long it takes me to make certain things. Remember your raw materials. Hey, if you're on the internet, you're sending messages and those are all, that's your time. Are you getting paid for the time you're doing that? And the other thing is overhead, all the utilities in your house, if you don't have an accountant or someone or know how to do that, you need to remember there are different things in your own home that, that will count. Do you have an hourly rate? Do you, does someone want you to make something? Do you want to teach? And again, it's your experience. Do you have to travel so far? Health insurance, if you don't have someone who has a, a job and there's no such thing as sick days. Oh yeah, there are. And then you can't go to a show or you can't do certain things. You don't have those paid sick days if you're doing this all on your own. The other thing that I think is important to nowadays are good images and they were in the past. I prefer during indoor where the lighting is controlled, but you can decide. Sometimes you want lots of different pictures. Focus on the product. Someone, you know, sometimes people put lots of other things in the picture and may look pretty, but then someone might want to buy the, if you have a flower vase stuck on top of something, they want to buy the flower vase and not what you're buying, what you're making. Use the same background if you can and show details. You might even need to hire a professional if you just don't feel comfortable. Nowadays, though, I think we all can do all sorts of cool things with our cameras. How and where we take payments. That's up to you. You almost have to do your research today. The two things, though, that I think people don't remember, don't think about all the time is their monthly fees. So some of these have a monthly fee you're paying, and then there's maybe the uh, processing fee is less. So you have to decide what's what's worth it for you. I don't do a lot of big sales, so I don't mind just having a percentage. But again, you're going to have to check it out for yourself. What works? Where are you going to sell? Well, we know we have our live Facebook. You could also do it on YouTube. There's all different kinds of shops out there and websites. You can even sell things on the marketplace. I know I've seen people sell yarn and other things there. Oh, wholesaler consignment. Sometimes someone wants to buy something from you. You can, all, you can just come up with a price and they can buy it, take it away, and then they can put whatever price they want on it. Consignment, the shop, two shops that I use, I get 60%, they get 40%. You could have an open house, truck, trunk shows. I had several open houses. They have those pop-up markets. And I know some people do farmer's markets too. And then you have the craft shows, which I'm going to talk about now. How do you pick a good show? Uh, since it seems like the doors are opening, more of us are going out. Yeah, location. How far will you drive? Well, I just did a show that was far away, but I stopped to see my sister-in-law. And I did okay, but I won't do the show again because it was just too much. Lodging, expenses, and meals, all those kinds of things. How many years has the show been going on? Is this where the money is? Interesting. I had, in where I, my hometown, I couldn't go downtown and sell anything at a show here. Go down to Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, where the money is. Oh, yeah. How easy is, to set it, is, it, is it to set up? Ah, inside or outside. I don't do outside shows anymore. And how does the public know about the show? The fees. Sometimes you go, oh, that's a lot of money. If there's a lot of money for a, a show, normally they're using that money for publicity and also your size of your booth. Is it a corner booth? Is it a big booth? All those kinds of things. You really want to know how and where it's the show's promoted. Are you part of the promotion, how well does you, your promoter talk with you? Is there an entry fee? And I wonder what the parking's like. Will people that buy have to walk really far away? 
and the attendance. If you can do it, go check it out. Talk to the vendors. I used to do that a lot. There's some shows I'm glad I did because maybe you don't fit in. Oh, these are things that we don't talk about. How many sales did you have? What's the best seller you have? How much money did you make at this show or online? What's a good show? How much money is a good show? What's a bad show? How long does it take to make a profit? For me, it took me two years to break even, but everyone's different. All right, whatever you need to do, you wanna find ways to keep customers interested in your product. That's, my, that's what I believe in. So sometimes you need to change things. Now I'm gonna say you can pick my brain, but I'm going to...